Hello and welcome to Calm Versations with the Voice of Reason. I'm your host, Benjamin Boyce, and today's Calm Versants are Isilt White and Malcolm Clark. Isilt is Irish and Malcolm is Scottish, and in this conversation we talk about Ireland and Scotland and their relationship, but mostly we spend a lot of time talking about their points of view with regards to the encroachment of gender into sex-based issues. From Isilt's point of view, the transgenderism affecting her work with women, and from Malcolm Clark's point of view, watching the LGB become the handmaiden of the tea, uh, more or less. And we also just get into a lot of really interesting history about their two countries. It's a perfect conversation insofar as the topic is there, but we walk around it like a few human beings. They're really wonderful people. Links to their socials are down there in the description. Without further ado, here is Assault and Malcolm. I'm in Ireland, where I normally am, because that's where I'm from and where I live. And I'm in Scotland, and I think you appear to have the same weather as we have. We have a heat wave in Scotland. Yep, we do. <clears throat> it's wonderful. An mm-hmm. Indian summer. Why, why is it called an Indian summer? No idea. I no bet idea. it's from colonial terms. That's what I'm yeah. <laughs> It feels it's a bit t- colonial. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those things that we should probably not investigate. <laughs> And have you guys had a good summer, albeit Indian now? Uh, well, the weather has been remarkably miserable. We had the rainiest awful. July on season in Ireland uh, forever, for all records, rainiest yeah. July. And, you know, that's pretty rainy because it's rainy in Ireland to the best of times. <laughs> However, I've had a good summer. <laughs> have you? What, did you? what made your summer good? Well, I went on a little trip to Bali and I went on a trip to oh. Santa Fe and I spent a few days in Kerry and a few days in Wexford and, you know. All right. Great. Lucky you. Lucky you. No, I've I've been stuck in Scotland for most of it. And equally, um, I mean, the west of Scotland is almost as wet as Ireland and um, and it's been the worst ever. So I'm just so glad. It, you, you, you try to forget about the weather. And then you realize, of course, it really does matter. And everyone is so much happier these last couple of days that we're actually going to get some sunshine. The Scots are miserable people, but it's I I blame the weather. That's what I I blame. I don't think either of the rest of us should comment on whether you're (laughs) miserable people or not. And I'm. (laughs) Yeah, and the Irish aren't, and they get just as much. No, we're not. We're really not. Huh. You must drink different things. Or more things. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I don't know that we drink more than the Scottish, but you know. Yeah. Maybe we drink more spirits. But you have that kind of dour Presbyterian thing going on. <clears throat> yeah, we maybe we can blame our history. You know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> huh. Well, you guys uh, the Scots gave us the enlightenment, so Cut yeah, out, there. Right? You gave us a you gave us more mumble jumble Catholic stuff. That we gave you the Enlightenment, but unfortunately, we, we ended up great miserable. literary icons. True, true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this could it become a, Scotland v Ireland. <laughs> I'm fine with that. Give me some history. Do you guys have some historical squabbles to to get into? Well, oh, well, no, the, not oh, really. That's the thing between Scotland and Ireland. Not really so much. I mean, our squabble is with the English, not with the oh, rest well, we, of the UK. We did. We were the shock troops. The horrible Protestant Scots went into Northern Ireland. Yeah, so and there's a huge history. They still history. feel a bit more. Yeah, there's a huge history between Northern Ireland and Scotland. So Scottish yeah. planters came over and sort of set up plantations in, in Northern Ireland. And so there's, and then there's been a lot of migration between both sides. Yeah. And so there would be certainly... The Scottish Gaelic and Northern Irish Gaelic is a bit closer, and there'd certainly be phrases that they use in Scotland that we use here in in our English. You know, like we'd say, it would have been traditional to say to go get the messages, which was to go and do your grocery shopping. And I see Scottish people say that, and we say it yeah. here. Well, we used to say it here. My daughters wouldn't understand what it meant. <laughs> <laughs> and the um, Scots were originally an Irish tribe. I mean, well, I mean, five hundred. AD, 400 AD, I don't know, round about then. whole bunch well, of nut our, jobs. From... Our monks would have gone over and set up monasteries mm. in Scotland as well. So there would have been a lot yeah. of backwards and forwards. But... Yeah. Huh. 
I've never been to Iona, not even yet. It's ridiculous, which is where, you know, the centre of of Christianity was that was brought by, I think, Colomb- Columbus. Columbus. Is that how you pronounce it? I don't know. I'm not great on which monks went yeah, where. Know exactly. Just know there was a lot of a them and they did all of these beautifully <laughs> illustrated manuscripts. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and we've got a very famous one in Trinity called the Book of Kells. And oh, wow, is beautiful. that where it is? Yeah. Is that where yeah. it is? I didn't know that. Oh, wow. Yeah. Great. So, apart from Christianity and the origins of the Scottish nation <laughs> what else would you like to know <laughs> well um so were any of the adventures that you went on this summer like business oriented or activism oriented it was just pure no just having fun summer yeah okay. great yeah because last time we well the first time and the last time that i met both of you guys was at the genspec conference in the spring or like right around what was that may uh, the very beginning of may and we were all on a panel. I was just hosting it about um, what would what would how would we say that about the um, the conflict the between homosexual rights and yeah, um, it was sort of about LGBT within transition yeah rights yeah. yeah. And so yeah, how and why are you both involved in that? And like that, that's what I kind of want to, that's kind of the general topic. And then like what's going, how things have developed, but. Well, I suppose what brought me, I mean, I've been following the whole situation for a long time, but uh, so two things, um, the transition of young people uh, when the evidence base wasn't there. So when I first started seeing questions about that back in, say, 2016, I started reading all the literature and really examining it and seeing that, you know, the evidence base simply isn't there for that and looking at the population of people that was transitioning, which is very, very different to, say, back in the 90s when I would have known women who were transitioning. And the women who were transitioning then were butch lesbians, some who transitioned, some who didn't, uh, and that's a, a, a choice they made as adults if they chose to transition. And so I was just kind of horrified seeing this happening to young people where there was no real exploration. They'd had no experience of their own sexuality to discover what what they could enjoy, what life might be like. Um, and also, it was just very sad to see all of these butch lesbians transitioning as part of my community. And uh, while I totally respect everybody's choice that they make for themselves as an adult, there's something in the culture at the moment that's really promoting that as a, as a sort of a better choice than, than living as a same-sex attracted person and just exploring your own sexuality. And so that was very problematic for me. So, and then, but the really the final thing that brought me into it <laughs> in a very big way was that here in Ireland, Tenny, which is our organization that supports trans people, issued this letter that was signed by 20 other NGOs that are all government funded, um, saying that people who believed that sex was real, basically saying the people who believed that sex was real didn't disturb didn't deserve legitimate representation in the media and uh, in the in politics. And I took very grave exception to that because, you know, everybody deserves to have a voice about issues that concern them. So that was what really sort of huh. brought me very vocally into it within the public domain in Ireland. And when was that about? That was back in 2020, November 2020, and part of the reason it all became such a big thing was that Amnesty was one of the organizations that signed that letter, and my grandfather founded Amnesty, and certainly Amnesty was not founded to be an organization that squashed people's freedom of expression. I mean, Amnesty was founded to protect political prisoners who were obviously need freedom of expression to be able to express their political views. Would we know that better in America as Amnesty International? Is that the... Is yeah, that okay. absolutely. Wow, okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah the, wholesale, the wholesale capture, or at least the lockstep um, march of all NGOs and then government institutions on this issue is fascinating and concerning. Yeah, it's, it's a fact. Fascinating change in the NGO landscape in the last 20 years. I think, I think this is replicated in other countries, but certainly in Ireland, 
we have a set of what are considered national NGOs, and they all get a certain amount of funding from the government that's pretty well rolls over year on year. So there's some tranches of funding that they might have to fight for. Um, so they, uh, but they all provide government with suggestions on policy. So it is like uh, a closed shop between between the civil service government and the NGOs in terms of policy on the issues with any yeah. of these organizations that are nominally sort of uh, identified as a national organization. And that's what we have. So we have the NGOs suggesting policy based on the funding that they're getting and government saying yeah. they've consulted with the public or whatever, or talking to the special interest groups. Yeah. 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 And by and large, that always, almost always favors a progressive point of view. They're always in lockstep, broadly speaking, towards a progressive. Progressive. Yeah. yeah. Progressive. Yeah. I mean, self-styled progressive. I mean, obviously it's not progressive, but it's, um, it's the same thing in Scotland. You, Starting with the Labour Party, um, and you have a whole bunch of organisations which are funded by what was then the Scottish Labour government to advise them on policy. And so you have this ridiculous sort of, I mean, they would see it as a virtuous cycle where you're where you're spending taxpayers' money to people that you know quite well, some of them are your friends, to advise you to implement the policy that you already want to implement anyway. And they can say, well, look, the entire LGB community or LGBT community wants us to do what we'd already said we were going to do in our manifesto or had discussed yesterday in our conference. So it's absurd. Um, right. And that ridiculous relationship, uh, you know, was then taken by the Scottish Nationalist Party, which became the the, the, the governing party, 10 years ago 12 years ago here and they've 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 turned this ridiculous situation into a fine art where they've captured the entire sort of institutional framework all the organizations and all the ngos and charities and campaign groups on a whole number of issues so that for example the rape crisis centers um are run by people who will defend to the hilt gender self-ID and trans woman gaining access to rape crisis centres. But of course they would because they're all paid by the Scottish government. And if they didn't uh, say that, they would lose their funding. I'm not saying that they don't necessarily believe it, but there's a strong incentive for them to go along with what the government says because the government pays their wages. Mm -hmm. But I was going to say, in terms of, um, I mean, I agree entirely with um, Iselt about the, the 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 reasons why lots of lesbians and gays have become agitated and are agitating against the capture of gay organisations and public policy by the trans movement. But uh, there's also, um, I suppose, I, I, whenever I speak to people involved in this, they who are of a certain age, um, i.e., more than thirty uh, or forty. Um, they they all remark that they are convinced that had they been growing up now, going through school now, the the possibility, the option of transition would have attracted them to say the least. Many of them say they would they know for sure that they were so confused and so troubled uh, when they were going through puberty that any answer that said, look, we can solve this, they would have grabbed at. But there's something about the trans child narrative, which is very compelling to gender non-conforming children and teenagers in particular, because it says, of course, you're having a troubled puberty of course you don't feel right in your body that's because you're in the wrong body and i mean of course that's going to um, attract a lot of troubled kids especially since we know that that a lot of them are also on the spectrum so it's the political and the personal i think that attracts people to to this campaign well that's the question Isolde, yeah i mean it's, it is the political and the personal so i mean i 
I didn't have that experience, but I know people who had that experience like Malcolm. And then, of course, for me, there's also the other issue, just simply being a woman and, uh, you know, working with uh, survivors of sexual abuse and rape and also being a survivor of sexual abuse, you know, being told that, you know, a woman who has experienced rape should use certain pronouns in the courtroom for a man who raped her or isn't able to find a medical examiner of the same sex if she wants or, you know, isn't able to get intimate care at any stage in her life by another female. Um, and the situation in Ireland is not really quite clear on that yet as far as the law goes, but we do have self-ID but we're in kind of a limbo here where nobody has challenged the law yet to see whether um, the self-ID impacts all of the equality legislation, which would have given women those rights. So I suppose when we talk about what brings us in, it tends to like be a very broad set of things for, for many of us. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, I, and, and, I, and would... I think there's an underlying homophobia involved in this, yeah. you know, like telling telling teenagers you know you know teenagers growing up with homophobia you know basically better off changing sex but not really explaining to them the medical burden that's involved in that for the yeah. rest of their lifetime and not just the medical burden but like you know i mean <laughs> in terms of forming intimate uh, intimate emotional and sexual relationships this can be complex for trans people, right? That's not just about bigotry, but if other people don't see you as the sex you see yourself as, that can challenge and limit who you end up in relationship with. Yeah, I mean, it's strange how there is probably no other medical procedure that is allowed to be promoted so relentlessly um, I mean, cosmetic surgery, there are limits, I don't know what it's like in Ireland, but there are limits to what you can say about cosmetic surgery in, in adverts and marketing. Um, and generally, even medical procedures, uh, you, you wouldn't, you can't imagine, you know, heart surgery being advertised to, to young people or, or something else that, that, never mind cosmetic surgery, things that are actually useful for people are not advertised in an uncomplicated only looking at the plus side way but but that's what's being done with the whole business of medical transition and social transition which is really just the beginning of it um, where young people in particular who are pretty vulnerable are being sold a major medical um, process that will go on for years and may never end and only really the positive, liberating, utopian side of it is being told to them. Um, as you say, Isel, that they don't get told about the the operations that don't work. They don't get told how unconvincing the, the work is. And they don't get told that other people, not just sexual partners, but generally will not actually believe all this. Um and they're not and 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 they're also convinced, and nobody tries to to balance this, that, you know, they fixate on this medical procedure as going to solve everything in their lives, whether it's their existing psych psychological issues or the, the things that are associated with their autism, their, their social discomfort, the fact that they feel isolated, that's all going to be wiped away by this magical medical procedure. I mean, it's, it's quite the thing, you know, in so terms of medical history, um, that, that, one type of procedure or one process of of medical intervention is being sold in in such sort of ludicrously utopian um in such a ludicrously utopian way so just uh for sake of storytelling what is the like the history of Ireland and Scotland with regard to gay rights and women's rights? Because I know that the trans rights is not a vector of civil rights. You guys don't have the same sort of uh, racial component to your civil rights that the America does. I'm sure there's probably some, and we can get into immigration if you want later on no. in the conversation. But um, We but don't have this, the same race. This people. comes at a particular point in your progressive social hmm. process of yeah. civil rights, right? 
So what led up to oh, yeah. that? Well, I'm sure so in Ireland, your two countries. Ireland is no, has been notoriously bad with regard to women's rights. Um, mm. And so being a very Catholic country and um, at the beginning of our state, uh, so say, let's say from the 1920s on, um, mm. when we sort of, we're not going to go into the whole independence of Ireland here, but once we got rid of English rule, <laughs> um, <laughs> we got a staunchly sort of Catholic and quite uh, quite authoritarian rule in place. And the Catholic Church took a very, very huge role in in that relationship with government that we sort of now see with NGOs. Um, and uh, mm. Catholic religion is notoriously anti, well, not anti-sex really, <laughs> outside of just for reproduction. And... Um, so any women that women that were made pregnant, say, as young girls or young young women unmarried, were frequently dispatched to what are called mother and baby homes, where where many some of those women were kept in these homes for the rest of their lives, working basically for for board and lodging for religious orders in in laundries. Uh, some of them called the Magdalene laundries. You might have seen movies about that. Um, and their children were taken away from them um, and sent to America for adoption. Other countries for adoption or adopted in Ireland. So we have this whole... And a lot of these infants also maybe weren't uh, medically looked after properly when they were born. So there was a very high infant mortality rate with these infants as well. And so this went up on up until the 70s. Very, you know, I mean, I can remember, I mean, you know, we this would have been an issue still in the 70s and the 80s. Um, so we have this this history of of and this is all unfolding in public over the last number of years with with children who are born in the homes looking for redress and looking to try and understand what happened to their siblings, to their mothers, to their fathers, whatever. Um, so similarly, we would have had we would have had similar legislation criminalizing homosexuality here because a lot of our law was inherited from England. So not from Scotland, which is a different legal system, but was inherited from England. And I'm not great on the dates when, when homosexuality was decriminalized, sometimes in the 90s. But then sort of moving forward, we were one of the first countries that, through a referendum, uh, made gay marriage legal. And that was back in 2015. And this was sort of like a renaissance for Ireland of sort of us coming out of the dark ages and... Um, moving forward and trying to have an equal society. But interestingly enough, that marriage referendum was passed prior to abortion being legalized. And abortion was only legalized a year or so later through another referendum where we voted to legalize abortion. I could say divorce. Divorce wasn't made legal in Ireland until like 1996 or 1997. We didn't have divorce up until that point. And uh, as part of the as part of the marriage referendum, which was a very popular referendum, because one thing about Ireland is that even though maybe it was a reasonably conservative society, I would say Irish people tend to have a live and let live attitude to other people. So when people said, well, look, all we want to do is get married and just ordinary people, most people kind of went, yeah, that seems fair. And so that's why that vote passed, right? By, by about 60 percent, 60 something percent, I think. Um, but as part of a deal uh, during that referendum, uh, what apparently I hear what happened was that the NGOs involved in the referendum sort of made a deal with the trans organization saying, look, if you could just tone things down for the referendum while we do the whole, we're all really nice, ordinary people and just want to get married, then we will we will work on um, legislation for you after that. And there had been this ongoing case of a trans woman called Lydia Foy who had wanted to get her documentation changed, her birth cert, passport, all of those things. And there'd been a ruling from the European Court of Human Rights that Ireland had to respond to and bring legislation in to allow her to vindicate her human rights. And as part of that, there was self-ID was passed. Now, the original legislation was much closer to the UK's GRA, uh, which would have been involved gatekeeping and, you know, a couple of years to explore your identity and then, you know, some kind of 
gender recognition certificate, but not with full self ID. But what happened uh, within that backroom deal somewhere between the NGOs and the politicians was about two weeks before that legislation was due to come to um, was due to come forward, the wording was changed and full self ID was brought in. And that was done without any impact analysis. And, and I have to say, I followed that legislation at the time and I, I, I didn't realize at the time or understand at the time the level of issues that pure self ID would cause. And certainly I was not a fan of gatekeeping adults who want to transition. Now, I just think like you're an adult, you make these decisions for yourself. I, I, if you want to transition, then you should do that. And I hope you're happy. And some mm-hmm. many people are. But anyway, so that's that's where we got to. So we when, had when self was that ID before 2015, 2015. So oh, we were right, the first right at the same time. 2016. Of, uh, so 2015 was the okay. gay marriage referendum. Six months later was self ID. And then six months later, abortion. Yeah, yeah, something like that. It's it's, huh. it's in and around that. Yeah. Okay. So so those rights were interesting, you know, and you know, those rights came before women had women had a right to choose to end a pregnancy. And we have a fairly limited abortion law. I mean, I that's what, and that was, what, I think that's all that would have passed. And I, I'm personally, I'm kind of okay with that. I don't have, I think, I think some of the American abortion law with very late abortion is just not, you know, I'm not comfortable with it. But anyway, mm. it took us that long to get abortion. But it was more than that. You couldn't even... You had to be really careful about leaving the country to go and have an abortion. You had to be careful if you were providing abortion information about abortion available in other countries. So there was a whole set of different legal complications mm. for women in that. Yeah, well, Scotland's story is very different uh, because luckily we, we didn't have the influence of the Catholic Church. <laughs> <laughs> Thank goodness for that. That's the, the upside of all that horrible Reformation violence. Um, but... <laughs> Um, we've, we've had, I mean, I, I suppose without the influence of the Catholic church, um, written, I mean, obviously had, uh, you know, abortion and a whole bunch of other liberal rights from the sixties, really the late sixties. Um, and, um, in the terms of the gay rights, I mean, that came roughly at the same time, I think 67 was when we, um, uh, past the partial decriminalization, effective decriminalization. It didn't actually um, impact on Scotland fully because even although nobody was ever, I think, um, jailed for, for homosexual acts after 1967, the law itself didn't get changed in Scotland to, to make it uh, legal to, to have gay sex until 1983. So I went to my first few, 1982 maybe. Um, and so the first few years at university for me, I was illegal. I was doing lots of illegal things, um, which is was ludicrous to think that, yeah. you know, I lived in a country where it was, you know, a, a criminal offense to have sex uh, with a consenting other person. Um, in terms of trans rights, I mean, it's it's interesting that, I mean, Britain really um, was one of the pioneers. And so the, the Gender Recognition Act, which was 2004, um, which had gatekeeping and it had to, you know, you had to take two years. And it was all kind of, it's, although it didn't say that you, you couldn't change your legal sex, um, unless you were either, and, or you, you, until you had this certificate, a gender recognition certificate. Um, and although it didn't insist that you were going through a medical procedure, there was an assumption built into it that there was a medical procedure. I think it said it was, you got a gender recognition certificate if you had undergone medical transition or were planning to. Yeah. Um, but you didn't, and so that's why there was a panel of three doctors. I think one had to be a psychiatrist. At the beginning, the gatekeeping was quite strict. Uh, and I think a few people were turned down and there weren't that many people who went through it. And in fact, that's what the the legislators, when they brought it in, they said there'll only be, you know, a hundred a year or something. They said that in its entire period over the next, you know, couple of decades, it would only ever be 
you know, 5,000 people, I think, ever, which is a tiny proportion of 60 million people. Of course, over the years, the, the, the sort of pressure on that medic that process of medical gatekeeping was was with so much pressure was put on it that they became less and less strict. And so you got to the stage when there was a strange contradiction when the trans um activists argued for gender self-ID, because they in the one hand they said it's really traumatic this medical gatekeeping. We must get rid of this medical gatekeeping anyone should be able to say that they are the opposite sex and, and get legal recognition. But then they would also say, and anyway, the gatekeeping's rubbish and nobody really checks. And you would think, well, if nobody checks, then what's the point <laughs> What's the point of instituting gender self-ID? Um, I, I think it had been um, degraded, if you like. It had, it, had be, it had become less strict. But I think it was important to keep it because it, it sort of – I mean, it's, I'm sure for women in particular, but generally, I think society should be saying you want to change um, the, your legal sex and you want the whole of society to validate that. Well, that's quite a big ask. I don't think it's an insignificant ask. And so it seemed to me, and in 2004, when, when the government passed that, they agreed. And if you look at the parliamentary debate, it's considered really quite a significant decision for an individual to take and for a society to recognize that decision and validate it. And so I think it I think it struck a lot of people when the gender self-ID debate started that there was just a, funda a fundamental sort of misunderstanding on the part of trans activists that they thought it was an insignificant thing for the rest of society to validate their decisions. And I think it's just taken them a little time to to realize that it was never, I think, going to be easy for society. The only places where gender self-ID has been brought in, like Ireland, was where essentially it was smuggled in. Wherever there's been a debate, wherever people have been allowed to really analyze it, mm. most people think it's a pretty significant ask of society. Most people are surprised, for example, to discover that even without gender self-ID, even with just the process that we have in Britain, that a birth certificate is rewritten. I, mean, I think most people, when it's brought to their attention, they think that is bonkers. This is a legal document, and you're going to go back and change a fact on the ground that a girl was born a girl, and you're going to change that and say, she was a boy. Um, and so it's interesting. There's a guy involved in in, in LGB Alliance, um, which I'm involved in, uh, Rob Wintermut, who was a human rights, uh, is a human rights lawyer, a major human rights lawyer. And he was involved in a thing called the Jogjakarta Principles. It's called Jogjakarta because it's some town in Indonesia. I have no idea why a whole bunch of LGBTQ people, top-notch lawyers, including, I think, Mary Robinson from Ireland, I think they all Probably. flew. Yes, they all flew to Indonesia because that'll really help the public know what's going on. And they flew and they had a big conference there where they drew up these sets of um, principles that they claimed were the, were the guidelines. If you wanted to have really good um, LGBT laws, you should follow these guidelines or these principles. And at the la and Rob was there, Rob Wintermitt was there. He's Canadian, he now lives in, in England. And at the last minute, um, a couple of trans activists asked to come along and be and be invited, and they were. One of them was Stephen Whittle, who's a trans man or woman who thinks he's a man, and um, he she went there, and um, and the pressure suddenly was put on the entire group to to include self-ID as a demand of the Georgia Carter principles. I think that would have been 2007. Um, and those principles, they were just drawn up by a bunch of LGBT 
I mean, eminent lawyers, but they were activists. And nonetheless, this became somehow, um, it, it became this sort of like holy writ that all the various LGBT organizations across the planet all took and all presented to their governments and said, see, if you don't follow the uh, Georgia Carter principles, um, you're not really um, doing the utmost that you can for for gay rights or trans rights. Um, and so that's how this idea, which had never been in anyone's law, was again smuggled in. And, and to this day, um, Rob now opposes gender self-ID, even though he signed the... Um, the documents at the time, a bit like you yourself and and most people, he didn't. He thought, well, so I mean, what's why are we why are we putting medical and other obstacles in front of people who just want to live their best lives? It sounds like it's just it's it's it doesn't sound like much of an ask. Um, and if you want to be kind and nice, you'll go along with it. But it soon became apparent that it was really just a sort of thin edge of the wedge, the end of the wedge, because 2000 and uh, 10 years later, 2016, 17, a whole bunch of other things were put in there. And it, they were essentially saying, if you really want self ID to work properly, then you needed to do this. And what they did there was they inserted the demand, um, which is often made, although very sort of quietly that, any sex language should be removed from any legal document, including birth certificates. So if the updated Georgia Carter principles were implemented by your by a country, it would mean that no legal contract, marriage, birth, or anything else recognized sex. And you you can feel in different parts of the world, in different places, in different courts, different LGBT organizations are are pushing away in different ways. Here in Scotland, um, Stonewall, the big LGBT charity, uh, pressurized and pressurized um, the Scottish government and the Scottish civil service, saying that the word mother was 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 one of the sexed terms that they should remove. And so it's through the Yogyakarta principles that you get all this nonsense about pregnant people, about uterus menstruators, yeah. uterus havers. It's because it's a sense, it's not, I mean, people are sometimes bemused to think, why are they arguing? Well, it's, on the one hand, it's just nuts, of course, um, but it's also, it's a central demand now of the LGBT or LGBTQ lobby across the world based on these legal documents drawn up in bizarrely in some Indonesian town. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and when when those things were drawn up and when people were first considering these, the the um, number of trans people was actually very small. But then we had the internet, social media, kids having phones, explosion, mm. which has ha has exploded things out in ways that I don't think anybody could have foreseen you know, even 12 years ago. Yeah. Um, so so there's just some <laughs> strange systemic thing going on in the world that, that brought a bunch of, I mean, I, like, I don't see all of these things as a big conspiracy. I just think there's no. a lot of things that have come together. Um, and, you know, it, it comes together with, say, feminist demands for gender equality and, you know, let's not say chairman, let's say chairperson. So so that those yeah. gender, those sort of degendering of languages demands were coming from feminism as well. So so there's just like a whole set of things that came together in a really bizarre way yeah. to, for us to find ourselves in in this massive change to culture and society that that. You know, I, I had somebody liken it to when the Christians took over from the Romans, you know, slowly, slowly, <laughs> suddenly the Romans were gone and Christianity yeah. was everywhere. And I can imagine there were some Romans going, well, what happened to all our gods? We were being nice and <laughs> letting you have your God. But now, now it's just Jesus Christ and you're one God, you know. Uh -huh. So I think that it's like some, it's some really huge uh, social shifts being forced through in, in Western democracies and and through NGOs being then forced through in and through NGOs and philanthropy, which 
again, that global mm. philanthropy is a thing of the last 20 years. Yeah. Being forced through in the developing world. So it's just a really, like, I just some days, I'm just like, what? What, <laughs> what happened? Um, and as you say, time. Is there, there's, there are more and more organizations, charitable foundations and campaign groups and lobby groups. And as Western society has got a more fantastic place to live every year, as we have more rights and uh, whatever, despite all the complaints, actually the economy is doing fantastically. We've never had, we've never had it so good. So what on earth do all these charitable organizations and campaign groups do? They need another cause that is a real bleeding heart, something that everybody can, can weep about and virtue signal about. And I mean, of course, there's still race. Of course, there's still economic inequality. But somehow trans rights became the thing that you could really pull the heartstrings and you could slam the terrible inequalities in our society. They were, as we've become used to hearing, they became the most vulnerable, you know, the, the most vulnerable and the most oppressed minority, which is absolutely absurd. I mean, if you, if you, I mean, I live in Glasgow, I can go to Castle Milk, uh, which is a really poor area, uh, I can go to half a dozen other areas in Scotland that are even poorer. The idea that you're a, a child in Castle Milk where multiple deprivation, terrible educational standards, um, terrible health outcomes, the idea that that child, working class child, is less vulnerable mm -hmm. and less oppressed than a white middle class lawyer Who's who? He who thinks he's a she it, it is it is something I think people in the future will look back at and just I mean they'll just laugh. It's absurd. Yeah. Well, and, Malcolm, and, and it's the this, entitlement. When did this hit your radar? And and how well, I'm have slightly you grown unusual in? because um, well, it, as a um, TV documentary director. I I did a show with April Ashley in the late nineties. It was sort of it was sort of the millennium. You know, it was for the millennium, and it traced the ups and downs of three families over fifty years. And April had famously uh, married a, a Scottish aristocrat. Um, she, I'll call April she. Um, I find it hard to, to be accurate with April's pronouns because I, I, I knew her. Um, but April and um, the, 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 the heir to the, the Rowallan uh, castle in Scotland, they were staying in, um, in Gibraltar and they went to the, 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 the vicar in Gibraltar and said, we want to get married. And he said, fine, because April passed completely. Um, I, I think had managed to change her birth certificate because, you know, in the 60s, there were so few transsexuals that I think you could quite easily get your birth certificate changed because nobody quite was. You just told them it was a mistake. I was born into sex. And as you can see, I'm a woman. And they'd go, all oh, right, yeah, you must have made a mistake. So there was no big process. You're talking about a handful of people in, in every year would do, do that. But so the vicar married them. And then... Um, the Arthur Corbett, the, the the heir to this uh, fortune, realized actually he didn't really like April that much. It also helped that his father, Lord Rowallan, who was really you know eminent aristocrat and a friend of the Queen and all the rest of it, said that if you've married what you've he Arthur Corbett divorced his his wife and had married a transsexual and um, and when the papers got a hold of it. Lord Rowell and said, well, that's fine. You've been disinherited. You're no longer the heir. And that sort of brought Arthur Corbett to his senses. And he decided he would divorce April Ashley. She then took it to court and it became a huge world, you know, across the world headline about this British aristocrat trying to divorce his transsexual wife. I mean, you're talking, I think, 60, 67 Maybe, I think, right, again, late 60s. So you can imagine how amazing it was. Um, the the judge came down on in favour of Arthur Corbett and said that he'd ne the, the, the marriage 
um, was never legal and valid because he'd married a man and you couldn't marry a man. Um, and and so that, I suppose, was the big... So I got to know April through telling that story, which is an amazing story. Um, she was considered an icon of the trans movement and, um, and still is. Very convincing, you know, six foot three, though, and um, so an amazing presence. And so you sort of thought, you know, and April made an effort to pass and was glamorous and was actually very charming. And I think that's the difference is that early transsexuals, um, the, the famous ones, most of the public looked at them and quite heard them. The ones that didn't, you know, the trans woman that didn't look like a bus driver, uh, the ones that had really made an effort, most most people thought, oh, well, what's the harm? I mean, April was very charming, very polite, went on all the talk shows and was very witty. And I think April was one of the reasons why a lot of British people were very relaxed about transsexuality. Um, However, having made that show with April, um, and there was something about April that I liked, but when she told her story, I always... I always thought, but this makes perfect sense. You're just a feminine gay guy who was a, beaten up when you were a kid. Because April was very, she, she said, I was a very feminine boy. And she, she lived in the really rough parts of Liverpool. And she said she was always getting beaten up for being effeminate. Um, and once they they um, stomped on her or him so hard that they broke her legs. And I, I remember telling that story and I thought, Fucking hell. Well, I mean, if you were a really effeminate boy and you were getting beaten that badly, you're going to be searching for some explanation. And if you become convinced that actually deep down you're a girl, then, you know, you can imagine that they would come up with that solution. But even when he told she told me that, I did think... Couldn't there have been just another explanation, April, that you were gay? Explanation or escape route. Yeah. I mean, Mm -hmm. and this was in the 90s. She'd have been a kid in the 1950s. I mean, illegal, everything else that was going against homosexuality. You can can imagine that you would pounce for that. But the other thing, you know, just a year later, funnily enough, I made a show about um, a guy, or I had to film a guy, a German guy, who was traveling to Scotland to have his leg removed, his healthy leg removed. Um, and he was a group, I mean, I, I when I was asked to, to do this, I was like, what are you talking about? So I traveled to Germany and I met this guy and the ridiculous thing was he seemed completely normal. But Hans, that was his name, no jokes. Um, Hans, who wanted his leg chopped off, uh, was um, a perfectly charming, intelligent guy, happily married business owner, but wanted his leg removed because he he was convinced that he had always been meant to be an amputee. Um, and I mean, it's up. And I, the, the reason that's important is because John Money, who's the guy who populated, invent the term gender identity, but definitely popularized it. And it was the leading figure in sort of transsexual studies in the, in the 60s and early 70s. His special subject was guys who wanted to get their legs chopped off. And he considered and compared them as next to identical as with transsexuals. He said if if you, the transsexuals have healthy parts of their bodies removed and and so do do these guys. These guys want their healthy legs, uh, healthy limbs removed. And I and and I we interviewed Russell Reed, who was the government advisor on the Gender Recognition Act and was the leading figure in um, the academic study of of transsexuality. And he himself said compared the two and and said if 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 a transsexual wants to cut a healthy part of their body off, um, then why why can't someone get their healthy limbs chopped off? Yeah, and there is a logic to that, but I think the logic works back the other way. I mean, he thought, ergo, you know, it makes it, it makes no sense to to stop people chopping their legs off. It it made me think, no, it's so obviously wrong for us to be chopping healthy limbs off that it casts light on the fundamental, if you like, psychopathology of chopping healthy parts of your body off, period. And that means your genitals. Um, and so I think from that moment on, seeing that the the leading intellectuals, if you like, in transsexual 
um, in the transsexual movement, really, um, were really pushing for something that just what once you're out there and you're doing that, there are you know there are people now who still campaign for people to be allowed to 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 have healthy limbs removed. They they will say ethically, there's nothing wrong with it. It doesn't. They use all the same arguments as the trans movement does. It says, oh, people will be much healthier and much happier. They're really unhappy at the moment because they're trapped in the wrong body. I think once you buy into that, the implications and the impact on children in particular of that sort of nonsense are really profound. I think somebody, I think um, uh, Cry Meyer, I think on uh, Twitter, did a wonderful thread where she used all the same arguments uh, that the trans movement use about medical transition and put it into the, the, the context of removing healthy limbs and, and saying, can you imagine as a child being told, though there's loads of people who, when they feel really unhappy uh, and, and when they feel a bit troubled and isolated and they don't have a lot of friends, it might be because deep down you really need to remove limbs from your body. Well, I mean, it, that we, nobody used to think 10 years ago or 15 years ago that, that there would be lobby groups going into schools mm. to try and voice this transsexual um, transition onto kids. It's a matter of time, not necessarily the chopping limbs off, but but once you decide that there's that people have hidden identities inside themselves that, ref, that aren't reflected in the body they live in, then everything from chopping your limbs off to multiple personality disorder to all mm. that sort of madness will be encouraged. Is old, is there is there a crossover? Now the thing about transsexualism or transgenderism is that there are very distinct differences between male and female motivations for this, uh, whether we like it or not. But within the butch lesbian community, is it is is there any echoes of this kind of obsession with like the loss of limbs or like the? What do you think is driving that? most of that community so quickly to embrace a trans identity, to masculinize, to use medicine, to masculinize. And does it make kind of more sense for them to do it? I know Aaron Kimberly and Aaron Terrell, it just makes more sense from their point of view. It makes more sense for them to present as men and they like having beards and stuff like that. Um, I, I mean, I think it, it's, t it's two things. It's, it's internal. So I think most of the butch lesbians that transition do, have gender dysphoria so they do feel deeply uncomfortable in their sexed body right so they're uncomfortable with their female bodies so so where where that comes from i don't know that we can fully say right so maybe it comes from birth or maybe it comes from from you know maybe it comes from growing up sort of as a tomboy but like i was a total tomboy as well uh, but i had no problem with well i mean i had normal women's problems with you know accepting yeah. my female body in a society that that prizes female bodies in very particular ways but I, mm. once i discovered sex i was like oh god i'd much rather be a woman than a man <laughs> this is great fun i can have multiple orgasms it's cool um so <laughs> um well, really, though, that was, I was like, ah, score, this is good. <laughs> um, but, but so the, the, the butch women that I would know that have transitioned would have all had a quite a profound gender dysphoria, right? So whatever way we, we, where we, where we say that comes from, you know, it does feel quite strongly held internally. So for, for the women that I would know. Um, my my sense of it is that, that it's not just psychological, that there's something else going on there. I don't quite know what. But then you have as a butch woman who's quite masculine presenting, but also probably, you know, has often been mistaken as a boy, as a kid and choosing to dress how they would feel most comfortable, which would certainly not accentuate their their femaleness. They they would be experience quite a lot of prejudice in society and get quite a lot of aggression um 
Uh, and especially if they're seen out with a femme woman, there can be quite a lot of aggression towards a butch femme couple because it's like, how did you score that attractive looking woman there when you're so pig ugly looking like a bad man kind of thing? That kind of attitude would have had difficulties with employment. So with that prejudice coming from society, you know, yeah, it might be easier to to present as a man. And of course, that can cause problems then within in the community as such, because then it's like, well, are you a straight couple? Are you a man and a woman? Are you lesbians? And so some of the women who would transition would sort of leave the community and some might stay in the community. But back in the 90s, when I, I was in living, I lived in San Francisco in the 90s. So back in the 90s, you know, it was very much a conversation in the lesbian community about butch women transitioning. And there'd be like, oh, well, you know, Maybe if they have the love of a good femme, they wouldn't transition and whatever. So I know women who transitioned and women who didn't. And, uh, you know, I know women who have lived very happily as trans men for the rest of their lives. And I think that's fine. Um, you know, it's complicated, isn't it? But but the, the, there's a very different cohort of young women now who are straight women. And that's a very and that's the majority of the of the young women transitioning. So there is a very different cohort there. And and I mean, that's quite different. But I so I think it's a mixture of prejudice in society against sort of masculine presenting women. Uh, and and I suppose I thought in the 90s, what we were trying to do was expand our notions of how people could live their lives and how gender could be presented. Uh, but that's not what happened. It seems like we've created actually um, a much stronger, uh, a much stronger force on young masculine sort of presenting women driving them towards transition and not even offering them the option. And I think an awful lot of, say, therapists or psychologists who are, you know, who are working in this area wouldn't understand what a butch lesbian really is. It's a very tiny community. So, so you have this very non-educated uh, set of professionals who, who don't really understand some of the communities that they're working with. Um, and don't understand that there's a population, you know, that, that you could, that a butch lesbian could live her life very comfortably and, uh, you know, in a more accepting society. And mm. yeah, so it, it mm. but I mean, the lesbian community itself has been very happy butch femme as well. Um, with the rise of feminism in the 70s and 80s, sort of that butch femme thing was very, very, yes. Uh, very, very erased by feminism. So, so again, you have this situation where there was forces coming from more than one angle uh, on on these things. So, you know, feminism does have have some answers, some things to answer for in all of these things as well. Hmm. Um, I don't think it's. I mean, I I I can totally get why some women want to be more like a guy um for obvious i mean there's the obvious stuff about the, the you know this this the escaping the the sexual sort of pressure from guys but but, but you know can i just before yeah. you go down there malcolm can i yeah. say it's not because that they wanted to be more like a guy this is quite an internal felt sense not of being a guy but just not of being a very feminine woman and right that we could have just as as a, a, a sort of a more camp gay guy has a sense of himself as a as a man, but not wanting to be very masculine. So, you know, one would hope that we could just have a spectrum of gender across both sexes and that that would be, you completely, know, completely. Yeah. But I, I do think there is a desire among I mean, I, I think what you're saying is that there was a lot of exploration and and obviously the wars and I remember the drag kings, you know, who were always sort of never never I know I never understood because they were never funny and they were never <laughs> they were always looked a bit silly but um but nonetheless it was a sort of time in the nineties when there was I mean I think Judith Butler still goes on and on about drag kings as they were revolutionary and they were the and so it was funny how mm -hmm. the nineties they there was all this exploration of the, the gender expression. Yeah. But then but then I think so, some 
woman who's, who would then become trans men or whatever, really, and I think this is where feminism became uncomfortable, they really bought into, they were no longer caricatured, but the drag kings caricatured men in the way that drag oh, queens some, did. Okay, the, the woman who won the first drag king show in San Francisco is a trans man now, right? Yes, yeah. Uh, you know, but but it, it, it is, you know... There's, yeah. Look, I think what I, I think the problem is they they when you do become if you do pass as a guy, I mean not like I mean I'm not you know moaning about masculinity or whatever, but you buy into a lot of privilege. I mean when you can walk down the yeah. road and <clears throat> swagger like a bloke, then and I think that's where wrongly or rightly, some feminists' antennae were sort of going off where they were thinking, well, <clears throat> wait a minute, you're you're taking on, you're not, and that's the thing about both sides of this equation, the trans woman and the trans man, they don't buy into, as you were saying, the gender spectrum of masculinity or the gender spectrum of femininity. They normally buy into the ancient stereotype maleness and the ancient stereotype femaleness. But I, I think that's painting trans people with too simplistic a brush because that's not my I experience. can't help it if they do I, that. Uh, well, that's not my experience of, of yeah. trans men, right? Yeah. So, you know, my experience, my personal experience is much more with trans men. And I, I just don't fully agree with you, basically. Yeah. You know, well, and and again, I think a lot of it. And if you were to talk to Aaron yeah. Terrell and the two Aarons, you know, a lot of it comes. The, there is the gender dysphoria, and there is the the particular set of prejudice and discrimination a woman who is more male presenting is experiencing in the world. Uh, I don't doubt some of that, but I'll tell you, there's something that we will probably disagree with. The I think what. Everyone is desperate to do as you're doing, which is sound very sympathetic. And I'm I'm all for that. She says, but patronizing. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm, I mean, sure, of course we have to be a sympath. Of course it's good to be sympathetic, but the problem is nobody is recognizing. And and I go back to the limbs chopped off brigade. No one's allowed to criticize the fact that a lot of it is fetishism. That a lot that drives this, that, no, and I'll give you the perfect example, is the phalloplasty, the least successful operation probably in the whole of medicine. There are a bunch yeah. of trans men who they are driven by sexual fetish, and you're not allowed to say that. You're, you know, it's always about the dysphoria, it's always about the discomfort, it's always about how boo-hoo everything is. But when, you know, for example, when the, the guys were getting their legs, legs chopped off, the guy that I interviewed did eventually get his leg chopped off, Everyone who we were talking to said, we've been absolutely careful. There is absolutely no question of sexual fetishism. It is entirely a deep-seated discomfort with the body, blah, blah, blah. All the psychiatrists said that. The surgeon said that he had double-checked, blah, 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 blah. When I was talking to Hans, and we were talking about in Germany, when, when I visited, I thought, he, he's sounding a bit, sort of, frankly, turned on by the whole thing. <laughs> Later, it turned out there was an academic paper which he took part in. It was revealed that he was part of a fetish group. Indeed, all of the guys who wanted their legs chopped off were all part of a fetish group. And and it was and, and so the reason I'm mentioning that is I think a similar thing goes on here where people, as with the legs chopped off brigade, there are some people who have genuine discomfort and pain and all the rest of it, but nobody ever mentions the sexual fetishism. And I think the sexual fetishism is important, not because I'm a Puritan and I think, ooh, that's terrible, because I think what we know about sexual fetishism is it increases and it's a very powerful driver of behaviour. And so that's why I think some trans men and women, but trans men, they start with the experimentation, the gender expression. It's actually quite a turn on for them expressing a male or masculinity. And I think it becomes quite compulsive. And that's where you get the phalloplasty. I don't know if you saw the Channel 4 show where they had a trans man on and he revealed his big phallus that had been cobbled together. Um, 
I mean, it's it's nonsense that this is. There is no way that cobbling together a piece of flesh from your arm and sewing it on your body and calling it a penis is anything more than just the weirdest sort of sexual fetish. I, and nothing will convince me otherwise now. <laughs> Are you happy to see me while I pump up my phalloplast? You know, like it just doesn't really work. Okay, I'm actually going to agree with you on a level here, Malcolm. You know, it's not discussed much, but there is an element of fetishism for some trans men. Absolutely. I agree with you. And the thing about fetishism is that it's really quite like OCD from a psychological perspective. And... uh, the more you practice the rituals in OCD, mm. the more they take hold and the more that you can't escape them. And and fetish is very, very similar to OCD in that yep. in that frame. Yep. Um, I just not I, I, I just as with trans women and there's a lot of fetish associated with trans oh, women, completely. you know, shouting that everybody is fetish is 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 due to fetish is wrong. And I and I heard you didn't say that, Malcolm, yeah, yeah, but it's yeah, one yeah. of those things that we hear out there. And, but we don't often hear uh, people acknowledging that there is fetish on the trans man side, and there and yeah. there definitely is, and fetish on some of with some <laughs> the butch lesbians mm. <laughs> that mm-hmm. transition, but not all of yeah. them, but some no, no. of them, yeah, there is mm. fetish there. And I mean, look, I, I, if if somebody wants to trans, I mean, I have no, no problem with I, I don't human female deciding I don't want to have breasts. I don't like the shape or whatever, and I'm going to have them removed. I mean, the question is, should that be on the National Health Service? Is that something, you know? Yeah. I don't know. And that's the difference, I suppose, Benjamin, for for Europe and America, you know, uh, because these things are funded by the public health, there has to be some form of diagnosis or assessment for that. And yet at the same time, trans activists are pushing for self-ID where there's no form of, of assessment or diagnosis. But then there's a then it's claimed that it's a human right that the public health service has to pay for and fund this lifetime medical bill. So that's where we get pushed back in, in Europe quicker than you do in America where you have yeah. privatized medicine. So the public health systems are going, yeah, we kind of need an evidence base for any any public health intervention. And so that's why... Finland, Sweden, Denmark now, all of their public health systems have pushed back on on youth transition uh, because the the evidence base being so weak Hmm. and the UK starting to. And Ireland's a little bit different because we don't have a gender service for adolescents and (laughs) they were sent to the Tavistock. And now the Irish government is trying to decide what other clinics in Europe to send them to, but looks like may choose Dutch clinics for that. Hmm. Okay. Well, what could possibly go wrong? We'll just exploit the kids. <laughs> Interesting. So, uh, for however long you guys have been aware of this issue or like involved with this issue, um, I, I guess there's two broad categories for this issue. There's the cultural, and then there's the institutional. There's the how the medical medicine operates, how the schools operate around this, how all these NGOs operate around this, how the law operates around this. Then there's the cultural aspect with how like to a certain extent it's the internet to a certain extent it's california promulgating these ideas you know and just blasting the world with these with these ideas so i'm wondering from a cultural point of view because there's a lot of different ways to talk about this or to get information into people's heads or to challenge ideas that are already in their heads on a cultural level on a personal person (laughs) level have you guys seen like or been attracted to going that route in the advocacy of this and, and what kinds of things have you seen work uh, to, to change the discussion, to, to talk people off of going down this route or to make people more aware of the trans, the differences between a butch les, a 30 year old butch lesbian, a 40 year old uh, autogynephile male, and then a bunch of confused youth, you know, and how all these different things are kind of different categories, stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, I I think it's incredibly hard culturally because actually sort of lesbian, gay and bisexual people are really a minority in the world. And so when it comes down to it, not so well understood. So the amount of straight people that absolutely can't distinguish between (laughs) trans 
and same sex attracted and that gender and sexuality mm. are, are two sort of related, but, you know, separate arcs is really quite remarkable. Um, but but so the, the, the conversations where I have managed to shift things uh, tend to be with using personal stories and just trying to, you know, point out that, well, you know, if I'm same sex attracted, uh, you know, it just doesn't really work when it's somebody of a different sex. And, and people can start to begin to get that into their heads. But it, it, I'm struggling. I've been struggling over the last number of years to understand a conversation that, that starts to shift things because there seems to be just this level of magical thinking going on for a lot of people that people literally change sex and because because most of those people don't know any trans people and you know they don't understand how much people haven't changed sex and how much every day a trans person is reminded they didn't change sex because they're always having to maintain interventions about their having changed sex. So if they if a woman stops taking tea, her body fat distribution changes. Like it's just nonstop, right? So but, but I'd love I'd love if we could explore ways of the cultural conversation that would begin to shift things, but don't involve some really regressive sort of both homophobic and and mm. equally sort of opposite mm. reaction, you know. I think it should be okay for people to explore the way they present gender. Gender, the way people present gender has been not been fixed over time, mm. you know, in you know, in the in the seventeen hundreds, men wore makeup and wigs and high heels and had huge dan like rich men, obviously, and mm. could wear a huge variety of different styles of clothes. I'd love if anybody has any ideas for how we could change the conversation culturally. Because yeah. I've been failing miserably. Mm. But you're doing mm. a good job, Benjamin. Mm. <laughs> well, I'm just a I, I think things are I think things are changing quite rapidly, you know. I mean, maybe it's because in the UK it's so prominent a sort of topic of discussion. But even in America, I mean damned as it is at the moment, the moment by this terrible tribal war between left and right where trans has become a sort of litmus test for both sides, which is unfortunate mm. because it means that that mm. um, if you're on the left, you somehow feel that you, back, you have to back on this gender identity nonsense. But even in America, the issue of sport has really crystallised for a lot of people the insanity of, of gender identity. And I, I think you can see in all the different world bodies are, are changing their their rules. Um, you know, look at the involvement of Martina Navratil. Even, you know, everybody's changing. I mean, three years ago, I think, uh, Martina was trying desperately to, to come up with a way to, you know, solve the Rubik's Cube of, of allowing as much trans involvement in sport as possible. Uh, at that stage, I think she was pushing um, for, for before puberty, it didn't really matter. Um, uh, but even when she was trying to defend women's sport at the adult level, um, you know, trans activists were accusing her of bigotry and, 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 and she was trying to be as polite as possible. She was trying to keep everyone on side. But eventually, I mean, I don't, I haven't spoken to her at all. I don't. I don't know. Uh, I've never spoken to her, but I've I've watched how her tone has completely changed. And eventually, people just give up on the the trying to please both sides. And she she is now posting full on tough stuff from Julian Bindle, Kathleen Stock, LGB allies, everything, shamelessly pushing for the defence of women's sport. And and in fact, in that respect. She represents the vast majority of Americans. Um, and, and I think that w the women's sport issue is, is really helping because that's where trans activists just so obviously went too far. Obviously, the kids thing is is um, is unfolding as we speak. I mean, I, I have a limitless number of people, friends whose own kids 
uh, either you know non-binary or gender non-conforming or whatever it is that they want to call themselves. I, I always say, thank God they're just non-binary. That's great. Well done. Because non-binary is meaningless, so, you know, and, and as long as as they the kids grow up, I mean, as long as their kids don't take puberty blockers and go through puberty and then think, oh, I quite like living in my body and, and have, you know, as, as, you know, when kids go through puberty, I don't know what the, the figure is, it's something like 85% of kids who have gender, non, um, gender dysphoria, once they go through puberty, Puberty is the solution to gender dysphoria for the vast majority, not all, but for the vast majority of, of kids who have gender dysphoria. And um, and, and so, I th so the main thing is that there's a growing number of parents and grandparents who see this, uh, the impact of all this promotion of gender identity in their own families. And I, I think the the effects of that hopefully will not be, as it certainly quite rightly warns, will not, you know, there is a chance that it could be a homophobic uh, reaction because gays are associated through the LGBT banner with this um, terrible sort of impact on kids. I hope it won't be homophobic, but I think there will be a reaction to it. And, and you, I mean, when LGB Alliance set up over three years ago, there was hardly any discussion in the newspapers about this and there was hardly any politician took it seriously. Now we have major politicians taking it seriously and we even have like opposition leaders rowing back, you know, our mm -hmm. Labour leader um, now acknowledges that, you know, some uh, men do not have a cervix and it, and which is a major victory. And, um, uh, but, you know, and and I and I don't get the sense that the Labour Party, if it gets elected, the idea that it's going to go down the 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 path that the Scottish government did of trying to push gender self ID, I just think is is highly unlikely. So, in other words, I th I'm very optimistic. I think things are going well. Yeah, well, I mean, I think the UK is kind of unique um, in how things are going, but certainly there is some shifts in Ireland, not yeah. not um, not sort of obvious <laughs> shifts like you have in the UK. But our our government, which is a coalition government, as most of our governments are, um, it's prob it's due up for re-election in twenty twenty six, but might call the election next year. And the sets of legislation that they had um, in the program for government to bring in, which include conversion therapy bill, this hate crime legislation, hmm. and some other some other things. Oh, a gender referendum, which was to change a constitution element in the referendum that said that women's role in the home or home slash family slash household, depending on the translation. Um, should be protected and uh, the NGOs have been pushed for that that to be taken out of the constitution. Anyway, what I'm trying to say is the Irish government is slowing down on bringing forward all of these pieces of legislation. So there was pushed back to hate crime, conversion therapy, final wording was supposed to be out in June and it was supposed to go to our Eroctus or House of Parliament for um, being enacted uh, in this in this sitting and and it hasn't been published yet and th there there's a lot more vocal pushback so when i first spoke up in public in ireland there was really nobody speaking up in public in ireland and now there's so many people you know i'm, I'm not sure really speaking up in public but you have a lot of pushback on twitter it's still very hard to get anything published in any of the media that, that yeah. challenges trans narratives. That's what um, I was going to ask, especially with Malcolm here about, you know, because you're a documentarian, you're, you, you hob with the knobs up there. Is there a, a shift in the media's um, no, take the, on this? Cause in I the don't press, how, yes. In the yeah. press, yes. Um, and there are in, in different places you know the odd tv journalist who's brave um but it's telling that the only for all his faults um matt walsh's um documentary um 
which I thought was brilliant. Um, yeah. It, yeah, it was really good. I mean, there was I was so annoyed with the bits at the top and the bottom with the sort of with him and his wife and family. I'm like, don't do that. Just ignore that stuff. But the heart of the, the film was absolutely brilliant. And it's absurd that none of the great documentary making channels, the ABCs, NBCs, CBCs in Canada, ABCs in Australia, BBC here, Channel 4, whatever, none of them have been able to tackle that subject with the guts and with the clarity and the humour of that film. Um, I mean, it was, I mean, to, 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 to hmm. take on these academics with their ridiculous notions and let them hang themselves with their own absurdities. It was, it was a really brilliant piece of filmmaking. So, and it, you know, that's but the, the fact is that's the exception that proves the rule. It is next to impossible to get things commissioned on this subject. Um, there was the odd debate, but I think the Gender Wars was done by Channel 4 that looked at the work of Kathleen Stork, and it was good. But, I mean, it's they really don't. I mean, there are, this, this is a, there are three or four different sign scandals hidden, oh. waiting in the whole trans movement. Puberty block is just one of them. The phalloplasty is like a, a huge medical scandal, um, and and yet the none of the the main. I mean, I worked on Horizon, which is the oldest science documentary strand in the world. It's been going since 1964, I think. Um, they wouldn't. I mean, they made the, the the film that looked at the amputees, the wannabe amputees. That was 20 years ago. They wouldn't touch anything on identity with a barge pole. They'd made sh they made shows 20 years ago, maybe 15 years ago, about transsexuals and transsexuality. They, and, the, and it's funny because the main reason is, well, two reasons. The, the, those channels, those media organizations all sat down in America and over here, 20 years ago, 15 years ago, they, they started to sit down with trans activist organizations because they wanted to be fair and to be kind and all the rest of it. And they rewrote their editorial policies so that you couldn't question the notion of gender identity. But the other thing is that within the organizations now, their staff, you know, it skews very young within television. And so loads of young, and you want young people working within your channel to keep it relevant. They're all captured by this, the same way that young people are in most organizations, because it's the it's the thing to go along with. And, um, and so you'd have a real problem finding people within your channel to make it. Yeah, and I think you do need, I mean, Matt Walsh's documentary was incredibly powerful and, and because it was funny and because he did a really, really good job. But I think there is just something archetypal about about transformation, you know, that, that's being played out here. So, so mm -hmm. sort of the stories about the trans kids and all of that, the documentaries that are done, they're playing into that sort of fairy type mm -hmm. archetype of of transformation um so there was Absolutely. a documentary done here you know following i think following five trans teenagers and it was a it was a nice documentary and it was it was reasonably fair documentary some of the people interviewed and it didn't end up transitioning and stuff but i think there was five who transitioned and to the best of my knowledge two of those have detransitioned and that documentary oh. was only made in maybe 26 17 2018 oh, wow. could you get could you get a media organization here to cover the fact that two of them mm. have detransitioned not a chance in hell wow. and i think that that so you get so much of a negative response sort of psychologically emotionally socially to detransitioning people because they've exploded the fairy tale of you know this wonderful transformation that we'd all supported you in doing and you're going oh no i don't want to be the princess i want to go back to my rags and you know i want to go back to my rags and you know bang around mm. in the fireplace and being downtrodden so that there's yeah. just something really archetypal involved yeah. in this whole thing that's a really good insight i think i, I was reading i mentioned it, i think to a couple of people but the, i read seems un, an unlikely comparison, but I read Tom Holland, the historian's um, book on Christianity. Um, God, what's Dominion. it called now? Yes. <laughs> and uh, it's really, really good. And um, what 
he he points out he it was it's brilliant the sort of like the thing you were talking funnily enough about the Romans and the Christians um, is uh, but what he points out is that the thing that really sold Christianity to to the Romans um, was that it, it offered this incredible sort of chance um, to to aid to live forever because. In Rome, you just went to some dreadful sort of plane of of, of uh, dreariness, um, but it also um, it, it was seen as morally superior because in, instead of you know everybody was equal, you you everybody could be saved, and it encouraged people to uh, the, the weakest would become the most powerful, the meek would inherit the earth. And that be, that was so un-Roman because as far as the Romans were concerned, the meek could, were just there to be exploited. But so Christianity right from the beginning, and I think it runs through all our cultures, even when we think it, it's, it's gone, this idea that the most valuable are the meekest and the most vulnerable and the most oppressed, and they are special and they will overturn the social order, a bit like your fairy tale. Um, I think that's, embedded in our culture and our culture is always looking for who who is the most vulnerable and the most oppressed that we can save and it just so happens that trans people have fitted this special role in our society um and i think it's going to be very difficult for it's very difficult to convince people that they've misplaced their kindness on a group that isn't actually the most vulnerable and the most oppressed and also as you say that they're not going to inherit the earth they're not this is not a group that that as kind as we may want to be are, are best placed to help us work out the problems of society well and and the one the, the trans people that have tended to become spokespeople for the community tend to be you know, the fairy tales, right? Yeah, you know, absolutely. Like yeah, Monroe Bergdorf, you think, oh, wow. I mean, if you were a kid, if you were a, a, a young gender non-conforming boy and you looked at Monroe Bergdorf, you'd think, wow, I could be famous and I could be successful and I could look good. And and of course, it's a fairy tale, as you say. And like when I saw, you know, one of the real high turning points for me was Caitlyn Jenner's Vogue cover uh, and Woman of the Year in this mm -hmm. like evening gown and i'm like seriously <laughs> what <laughs> of you on was, Vogue? <laughs> yeah with all that plastic surgery and that yeah. couture gown and you know like there's this and 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 i think a lot of people who aren't living with the repercussions either in their personal relationships or um, with people who have transitioned watching what happens to them medically can sort of believe in this fairy tale. But like, it's not a fairy tale in reality. You know, yeah. it's just not a fairy tale. So I think somebody like Corinna from Heterodorks, her, her voice is important, her, his voice. I don't think he cares what pronouns. But Corinna's voice is important because Corinna is one of those people who will talk about medically what what's difficult but i mean there are difficulties for all trans people medically longer mm -hmm. term mm -hmm. there's also a real problem detransitioning i mean that's a thing that i think part of the gender critical movement hasn't quite addressed is that especially if you're a tra if you're a trans man and you want to give up test and you've been on testosterone which gives you an amazing kick i mean it's, a testosterone is a drug that is addictive I mean, we know that yeah. from bodybuilders. Um, but if you're going to come off that, you're going to lose a lot of your oomph. There's going to be a withdrawal. Um, but if you're a trans woman and you're going to come off stuff, it's actually it raises a whole bunch of medical problems. If you've if you've had a neo vagina created and you're going to come off estrogen, um, there are really practical problems: uh, a hair growth. Um, you know, I, th this is something that I, I know some trans women who now call themselves guys again still stay on estrogen because mm -hmm. it's it's not the easy. It, you, you can't basically it's very hard to it's impossible to undo it, but it's quite hard to come off the medical treatments and and so there will be a group of people I think who will who will be officially the sex they were they, they've acknowledged the sex they are but the, but they will still be trans in one sense because they'll be 
yeah. taking the medical treatments. So are you guys involved together on anything or you just your interests overlapped and you guys get roped into different conversations such as this one? I would be yeah, no. I would love to work on something with Zill, but we haven't yeah, come up with anything. <laughs> we haven't. <laughs> hmm. So where do you put your energies then? Uh in speaking out about this issue or other issues? Well, I'm I I'm, I work with LGB Alliance. Yeah. off and on um i'm on the management team and we uh, you know our big priority is just you know protecting the rights of gays and lesbians and bisexual people but also sort of we sort of wave to the rest of society that this has nothing to do with us this madness is not in the name of gay people so it's a sort of double role just by existing we we managed to protect gay rights but by, by preventing people assuming that we are part of the nuttery. Uh, but I also, I mean, I, I think it's really, one of the things you were saying, what can we do? I think there's a huge research project to be done to trace how we got to where we are now. I mean, I'd be, I, I write a sub stack um, and I do a lot of research on this, really trying to use my documentary skills to try and, hmm. you know, trace things. I mean, I'm, at the moment I'm trying to unravel the whole story of Kinsey. I mean, there's been, there was one great documentary done in the nineties about um, his investigation at great Kin the, Great Kinsey report, which relied on uh, a huge amount of information from the worst paedophiles you can imagine. I mean, like guys who were there was one guy, one chapter in the Kinsey report is is about paedophilia, and it's it, the bulk of it was based on a guy who had abused around about 500 kids, mainly boys, including infants. I mean, two and three and four months old. And so it's interesting that Kinsey was very influential in the sexual revolution. He was really influential in the birth of the gay movement in the 50s. Um, but um, and, and I think his influence has, has permeated uh, a lot of... Um, LGBT organizations. Um, so I think un unless you research and unless you find out and join the pieces about who influenced who, I mean, Kinsey was best friends with Harry Benjamin, who, who founded WPATH. Um, he, he knew John Money. There's all those intellectual roots. I mean, I don't. it's not in any sense mm. a conspiracy, if you like, but unless you know where these ideas came from and how they evolved, I don't think it's it's we're able to really challenge them properly so i think mm. there's still a job to to work out how we got to where we are yeah and that's one thing that you know the whole element of pedophilia that that runs alongside this uh, is very disturbing and it's a thing that you know malcolm writes very very well about but it's you know <laughs> It's hard. It's hard when everything's been called grooming to really talk about what yeah. what what is actually really deeply sinister within that. Yeah. But we all know um, that paedophile organisations have always tried to uh, come in on the coattails go of of um, lesbian, gay, and bisexual rights. Uh, mm -hmm. um, and I I find that very challenging. In terms of activism, you know, at first for me, it was really more about uh, trying to create a space for people to speak up in Ireland. So I think that's been accomplished. People are speaking up. I don't like a lot of what they're saying nowadays, so I'm <laughs> stepping away. <laughs> um, but, you know, I think the Gen Spec conference was wonderful. And I, I think in in fairness to Stella and Gen Spec, that, yeah. that the vision of putting something alongside WPATH that's really trying to present an alternative um, has been really important. Uh, and so what I'm trying to find now for my own activism is what I would things that feel generative, generative, that feel like they're creating something and moving forward rather than shouting nastily at people because that's just yeah. not who I am. Mm. Um, so I've done some smaller projects with some friends on Butch Femme stuff, but that's just for a tiny little community. But just to say that there was, there is this thing there that, that, that you know, so that only affects a tiny number of people, but... Um, mm. I also work on a personal level in my psychotherapy practice. I do work with uh, detransitioned people or people who are 
post-transition, you know, whatever that means for them. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's work to be done in, in the area of, of, you know, educating psychotherapists a little bit more broadly on some of these things. Because um, like I say, I, I, you know, I think that when people don't understand the nuances of different people in the community and different styles of sexuality and, and different understandings of gender presentation, they can they can very blindly affirm something that that without any questioning. Um, mm-hmm. But but finding ways to talk about those things that that uh, in, in this febrile environment. So I think a lot of those conversations need to be done much more quietly. So I have quiet conversations with people and, yep. you know, it's obvious what, where my, you know, anybody who knows my public profile mm-hmm. knows what my opinions are. But but I think a lot of conversations need to be had more quietly as opposed to everybody, because there's such a lot of shouting out there. And there's, you know, it's, you know, there there's a lot of just deep unpleasantness and tribal yeah. fighting and polarization. And then. And the people that get hurt in the culture war are the people caught in the middle of the culture war. You know, all of the warriors on either extremes, they don't get hurt by it. So for me, I'm trying to focus on how can I support the people caught in the middle and how can I have conversations with people that might move things forward. But, Mm -hmm. you know, it's very difficult here in Ireland to get any grip on any of the institutions. Uh, but I still think by holding a space, you create a space that some people can maybe step into. And I certainly think that there is a shift politically that that the the government parties are understanding that, you know, this yeah. is not a slam dunk when it comes to their core voter base. So they, I think they'll do an Irish solution, which is like just go quietly, brush it away. And, you know, hmm. but I think if, if anything can be held back for a period of time, that's a good thing too, because more information comes to light, more understanding comes to light. Um, and I think, you know, I think what Malcolm said about sports is very accurate because it's quite clear that a lot of people don't think trans women are women when it comes to sports. And once you, once you explode the myth anywhere, it sort of, it has a ripple effect. And I think one of the reasons that sports that sports really worked so well is because I think at at core humans want things to be fair. And I think most people look at trans women in sports and go, that's not fair. And dads are looking at it for their daughters as well. Whereas if it's just all that LGBT stuff, it mostly doesn't impact, but like it does impact everybody Mm -hmm. in sports and people want things to be fair. So look, we, we keep moving on but for me my focus i just want to try it to be wholesome in a way (laughs) (laughs) because there's some lack of wholesomeness in this whole Hmm. thing Hmm. are you Hmm. involved in developing resources specifically for detransitioners do you feel like as your uh, experience accumulates you have uh, you're seeing more patterns or at least tool sets for that cohort well you see I'll I'll say this, for an awful lot of detransitioners, it's the fundamental mental health issues that they came into transition with that need to be addressed as they come out. Uh, That's not true for all, but, you know, we have such a high percentage, particularly among the girls, but on both sides of um, neurodiverse people who have a specific set of needs that haven't really been addressed in psychotherapy well enough in general. So also because I work with eating disorders and there's very high, (laughs) a lot of similarities there in that, you know, a very high percentage of girls with anorexia are autistic as well. And, And the path into anorexia for autistic girls is very similar to the path into transition for autistic girls in that they take certain things quite literally so you give healthy eating advice and it's like well i should never eat fats and suddenly Mm -hmm. they've lost weight and become anorexic very similar with the transition so specific resources are hard but there are definitely patterns emerging um 
but a lot of it is stuff that we knew, you know, a lot of it's stuff that we knew 10 years ago when people were given more psychosocial support prior to transition. It's not very different, mm -hmm. but yeah, it, and, and, and it's hard seeing the devastation in people's lives, you know, because there's such a grieving process to be done if if somebody detransitions and is uh, unhappy with how their body is now and the things they've mm -hmm. lost and the things they gave up on it, it like i do sometimes it's hard work actually as in distressing work mm -hmm. uh, uh, it's distressing seeing seeing people who are as teenagers sold such a lie when when many of us knew it was a lie they were being sold at the time. Hmm. Malcolm, what's your Substack's name? Um, it's the Malcolm R. Clark. Uh, no, it's Malcolm Richard Clark. Malcolm Richard Clark, The Secret Gender Files. Ooh. Oh, and there's my tenant has just arrived. Hello. <laughs> With knives? <laughs> I thought we'd be done, but either it was an hour, so I didn't want to. <laughs> yeah, and Isil, is there a place where people can intersect with you? Do you do you have like a blog or like all your secret recipes? Well, I haven't been writing on, on my sub stack. I mean, okay. at Isil on Twitter, uh, yeah. you can vaguely interact with me, but not so much at the moment. Um, but my sub stack, I mean, I may start writing again. Yeah, I'm a bit exhausted by the gender wars. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think you're right. you, you have you, to be you in there to. all the time. Yeah, exactly. I think it's really good to step away regularly. I don't really get involved in many arguments, um, and, no. I, and I you know, online anyway. And I, I find that the effect is that the other side get bored and they don't bother to attack me. They ha I hardly ever get attacked by anybody. Some random fool will, mm -hmm. will come on occasionally, and I'll, I'll, you know, ignore them or block them. But, That's um, what I, I'd like to say, because people say to me, God, he's such, you know, you know, you've been very public. Have you experienced a huge amount of, you know, trauma because of that? And I, I'd just like to say, no, I haven't. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I mean, I think I've lost some bits of work here and there, but, you know, nothing, nothing that yeah. that has impoverished me hugely. Um, and. But I, and again, I'm like Malcolm, I don't really argue with people and people don't attack me. I get very little attack. And and, yeah. and I think right from the beginning, like the first week I spoke up, there was a few people trying to attack me and I kind of laughed at them and sent them K-pop gifts and said, whatever. And, you know, I, I, but then again, I don't attack people either. You know, I make points. I have, I have hmm. reasons for them. I'm clear in how I speak them out and I don't attack people. So, you know. But that's not to say that it doesn't happen because Roisin Murphy, who's one of our, um, who's a, a music artist here, who's dance music, Maloko, she's a very famous dance music artist. Mm. And she made a comment on her private Facebook page about puberty blockers and trans activists got a hold of it and put it all over Twitter. And now her record company is saying they won't promote her record and, you know, so, you know, and all just the proceeds depends. go to uh, trans charities, too, from her. Yeah, but, and, and that's their proceeds. They're not her proceeds. So, oh, okay. like, they can't dock the money, whatever they contracted no. with her. So, you know, yeah. but anyway, they're doing damage to her. Uh, and again, like, she, you know, she said so little. Um, so certainly people have been hugely attacked. But like Malcolm, I haven't been hugely attacked. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Favorite drink? Mm. Gin and champagne tonic. and whiskey. <laughs> uh, gin and tonic and what and whiskey? Champagne or whiskey. Oh, okay. Oh, I thought there were two together. I thought that, no. that is great. I, I, was like, I love the idea. Which mood am I in? <laughs> Do you like a margarita as well? <laughs> yeah. It's too much fuss to make it myself, though. What's yeah. your favorite drink, <clears throat> Benjamin? Oh, I really like a good old fashioned. Yeah, or a salty martini. Um, Ooh, those are two good. different things, but yeah, salty like martini. Old, Negronis, uh, the Negronis. Yeah, what's I mean, what, what's a Negroni again? It's like a Campari and vodka, or yes. I am not a fan of Campari. 
No, I think Campari, I think everything is improved by the addition of Campari. <laughs> when, I was, when I was 15, when I was 15, my grandfather published a book and he was on a book tour in France and he brought me along on the book tour in France and we were invited to the Irish embassy for lunch. Ooh. And I was asked what I would like to drink and the only drinks I really knew were Campari and soda from like reading novels. <laughs> so I asked oh, no. the Irish ambassador in Paris for a Campari and soda. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, I, I don't think we have any Campari here. And you have to send staff off to find the Campari. Comes back with the Campari and soda, and I taste it. I was like, oh my God, this is disgusting. And now I have to pretend to drink it because I demanded yeah. Campari and soda. I don't like Campari and soda. That's that a horrible drink. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you very much for, for joining me. Yeah, and, it was uh, really enjoyable. Giving some insight into, from your perspectives, you know, and kind of widen the widen my knowledge and understanding of how your countries are, are operating differently. And so what you said about the NGOs replacing the function of the Catholic Church, I think is a profoundly overlooked yeah. point in how power yeah. operates, not just within your country, but within every country. It's like there is... There is a church state influence. It's called progressivism. And they use NGOs just like the church would have used whatever capacity it had to, to be the buffer between power and the citizenry. There's that extra layer of like social policy and what's right and what's wrong and how we're going to yeah. tackle these very social issues. Well, bizarrely, I mean, I just finished reading in the closet, in the Vatican closet, which I think was 10 years ago. And it's such a good book about the way in which basically, basically how dominated the Catholic church was by gay men uh, is dominated. Uh, they're not necessarily all having it off, but they're homophiliac. They have the desire. And of course, I, I because I'm not Catholic, I, I, I'd always thought it was exaggerated, the, the amount of gay guys in the Catholic Church. But he explains if you were a young boy growing up in provincial France or Italy, and you're not interested in girls, it quickly becomes apparent that you don't have a girlfriend. And so what do you do? you gravitate to the priesthood because then nobody's going to say, why don't you have a girlfriend? So it's a huge, or mm -hmm. up until recently was a huge reason why there was so many gay guys. But what's interesting too is, and the reason I mention it is, it's a similar sort of way in which this strange sort of group of intelligent gay men within an organisation work in a sort of secretive way where they're all... In in the Catholic Church, if you're gay, it's in the parish. He says was the was the um, was the the term that was used, the euphemism. But what's interesting, uh, I mean, I got I sound like I'm obsessed with paedophilia, and I'm not. But interestingly, the um, the that he says it it wasn't that there was a huge number of these gay men that were paedophiles. It was that the fact that the the paedophiles within the Catholic Church could use the secret homosexuality of so many of the top clergy as a way of silencing criticism that you that when uh, benedict and other people wanted to try and bust the abuse circles the people who were abusers knew all the secrets of the people above them and so you had this really bizarre dysfunctional organization wow. where pedophilia could go secretly and underground and couldn't really be punished so there's but do you a, think but with but with regard to yeah. i think that that's very accurate about the catholic church but with regard to the state giving over power to the church or to the ngos <laughs> i mean sometimes i feel like it's that you know politics is quite corrupting for your soul in a lot of ways and so maybe they need to outsource their sense of moral morality to a separate set of groups or a separate position yeah. in society. And so now mm. that they're no longer outsourcing their morality, like their their moral compass, because I think many politicians have unfortunately stepped away from their own internal moral compass by the time they get to positions of power. And I say that as somebody who whose family was in politics, right? So I, I I'm not just saying it sort of innocently or, you know, without yeah. without thought behind it. But it's like 
that 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 moral compass has now been handed to the NGOs to to operate for them. Uh, the and it's uh, yeah. And I'm not quite sure what I mean. And I think then what animates so many activists is is a fairly simplistic sense of right and wrong and wanting to be on the side of right and be a savior. Yeah. And so you get so many people within activism uh, who who really want to ride in on the horse and save people. And the problem with so much activism is a failure to listen to the cohorts that they're purporting yeah. to help. And, and again, I say that, you know, having worked, you know, having been on, not having worked directly in NGOs, but having been on the board of NGOs and having watched how NGOs operate and also having watched how NGOs operate when you when people make a complaint about how they operate and that the level of vitriol they attack their service users who complain. It's it's a very it's yeah, hmm. there's a lot about the power dynamics in there and how people are outsourcing functions that they should take responsibility for themselves. And I think that talking more about some of those things could be really yeah. useful. Well, it's interesting that the Catholic Church essentially offered politicians a way to sort of expiate their sins. You know, that they politicians know that every day they have to make moral compromises, they have to take tough decisions and put people's noses out of a joint. But with the Catholic Church, you know, you sort of were allowed, to, the Catholic Church would allow you to do something that was morally good, that would sort of wipe away all those terrible, real politic compromises. And in a funny way, that's what these groups do, the NGOs. The politicians can turn away from the horrible, messy compromises, the education cuts, the hospital cuts, all the difficult decisions that they have to take every day. They can turn to the, the LGBT organisations that are morally pure. And all they have to do is introduce some tiny little law that won't make much difference. And of course, very much. <laughs> exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. They don't turn to the trade unions and say, hey, what law could be introduced tomorrow <laughs> that would make your lives better? Because they know that would cost an arm and a leg. <laughs> well, great yeah. convo. Um, I'll, I'll I hope so. Up there. I hope you guys have a good evening. I guess it's now it's September and you guys don't have a Labor Day. so No, no. we don't. We're... No. we're the LGBT days, that's all we have now. Every week is a pride march. I don't understand what's going on in your country. I don't think any of us, pay, either Malcolm or I, pay attention to pride for a long number no. of years at this no. point. Yeah. No rainbow gets flown from my flat. <laughs> yeah. Oh, excellent. Excellent. Thank you so much. So you cut Thank this you. down to something, to, to like an hour oh, or something. God, why would you even say that? Why would you?